Okay, welcome back, uh, everyone. The next uh, item on the agenda is the uh, proposed term accounts priorities. We do have a presentation. Mr. Manconi is uh, not here, but it will be led by uh, Phil Landry, and then uh, Vivi Chi is here as well. So, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so, uh, we're here today to talk about the terms of accounts of priorities. Uh, tied to the Transportation uh, Services Department. So just a bit of background, uh, November 6th, the proposed priorities were uh, tabled to Council. We're here today at Standing Committee to consider them, um, and then next uh, Wednesday will uh, be approved by Council. So specifically for um, transportation, uh, there's four actions. There's the Transportation Master Plan, uh, Implement Mobility Safety Initiatives, uh, the Temporary Traffic Calling Measure Program, and work on the autonomous vehicles. So at this point, I'll pass it over to Ms. Chi, who will talk a bit about the transportation master plan. Uh, yes, uh, Chair, I think you've covered a lot of this at the beginning already when uh, you kicked off our, uh, the announcement of the start of our transportation master plan. So it is a very important uh, exercise, an important document for the uh, planning uh, and managing of growth and how we serve that growth through transportation. Uh, so this work is already starting and we will be finished by April of 2022. 20, uh, we have a lot of data that we've been gathering um, all through the years, <clears throat> different sources, but uh, one of the key ones is the origin destination survey. So that will be starting next, uh, next fall and it'll take about a year to um, clean the data, make sure it's all in place and calibrate our um, model and that serves as a check uh, to see where we're going with our trends and so on. So with the TMP, um, the previous, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the previous uh, vision and the principles will likely remain intact. And so now we would proceed with some of the newer issues that we have to do with the TMP. Autonomous vehicles for one, uh, equity lens for another, and then the um, different uh, modes of um, how transportation is morphing because of that last mile and perhaps uh, we can use uh, other technologies to help us with that. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. Uh, there will be plenty of consultation um, included in this process and we will uh, be also updating our website, tmpupdate.com.ca, sorry, on this uh, with the information as we progress through. Okay. In terms of uh, mobility um, safety initiatives, so um, the, the first one is tied to the existing programs we had in the last term of council, such as the PXO program, the pedestrian safety evaluation program, um, the cycling safety program, the accessible uh, push uh, pedestrian signals, and also Safe Roads Ottawa. So those programs have been carried over. Uh, the, the next item, the temporary traffic calming measures, that's the, uh, the $50,000 that's allocated to each ward councillor to implement uh, temporary measures such as our flex posts or our pavement markings. Uh, and a new one for this term of council is uh, the work that we're doing in the autonomous vehicle group. So we've uh, started to, to participate on, uh, on projects. Um, we had our eco drive that we've been doing uh, the last few years. Also work with uh, technology so that we can communicate with autonomous vehicles and connected vehicles at our traffic lights. Uh, we're also participating on the L5, at the L5 site as well as the uh, Canada test track. So it's continuing to do that work and it's focused on the technology at this point in terms of ensuring that our traffic system uh, is able to communicate as new technologies come on board. And with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we do have um, public delegation, but I'll have uh, Councillor Fleury has a motion. I'll have him introduce that so that the speakers uh, can choose to speak to it or not. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Whereas the city is establishing its term of council priority 2019-2022, including uh, a high-level priority on integrated transportation, whereas interprovincial heavy truck traffic on King Edward Avenue continues to degrade the livability of the community through which it crosses, Whereas there are potential options to mitigate the negative impacts of the high volume of truck traffic through the, the downtown, such as a traffic tunnel or a new interprovincial cr crossing. Whereas interprovincial bridge crossing, planning, design, construction, operations, funding are under federal jurisdictions and the connections to provincial highway systems are the responsibility of the res respective provinces. 
whereas the tunnel option connecting the 417 to McDonald Kelsey Bridge would resolve the City of Ottawa issues of having interprovincial trucks going through our downtown streets, whereas the tunnel option is the responsibility of the Ministry of Transportation of Ontario as per their mandate to connect 400 highways to interprovincial crossing, which was never achieved in Ottawa. Therefore, be it resolved that the City of Ottawa reaffirm and identifies this downtown heavy truck traffic issue as a term of council priority uh, that is in dire need of a solution, and further, it, further, further, it be it resolved that the City of Ottawa work closely with the federal government on its reinitiation of the new provincial, a new interprovincial crossing study and other related studies pertaining to the strategic transportation planning between the two provinces. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we do have a public delegation, um, Mr. Alex Collin from the SCA. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm here on behalf of the FCA. Um, the FCA Transportation Committee did review the uh, term of council priorities for integrated transportation um, and wanted to bring two issues to your attention um, that they felt that should be included in the list of uh, term of council priorities. One deals with interprovincial transportation, uh, the other deals with getting the trucks off King Edward. Um, as you know, um, uh, VBG just talked about the transportation master plan and you can expect that through the transportation master plan, um, certainly the issue of interprovincial transportation, uh, transit connections would be part of that process and that is in uh, part of your term of council priorities. Uh, parenthetically, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank staff, city staff for um, helping us hold a workshop for FCA members on the transportation master plan update. It was a very useful Saturday morning we spent at Tom Brown Arena uh, going over the, uh, all the premises of developing a new transportation master plan. But as, um, uh, as you know, Mr. Chairman, um, 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, um, the NCC did conduct a uh, federal, provincial, province of Ontario, province of Quebec, city of Ottawa, city of Gatineau, interprovincial bridge study, where they did identify that this region needed two more bridge crossings. Unfortunately, that study uh, crashed and burned when the government of Ontario pulled out. Um, but we now know today that the federal government has mandated the NCC to refresh that study and therefore it is absolutely timely, never mind a transportation master plan that's looking out to, I think it's 2046, but as a term of council priority to have this listed amongst those priorities uh, because uh, we're 10 years out of date already. Uh, secondly, the, uh, with respect to getting trucks off King Edward, uh, that has been a long-standing sore in this city uh, for decades upon decades. And I know the previous council struggled with this, came up with a feasibility study, uh, which identified an option, some possible options, uh, in, in order to have better goods movement, but also more safer goods movement. It is a blemish on the city of Ottawa that all these years we endure accident after accident, death after death, injury after injury, with trucks going down, crossing into Quebec along King Edward. Um, and so uh, certainly we believe that that should be on uh, your term of council priorities. Um, um, so in the bottom line, Mr. Chairman, is we're very pleased to see uh, Councillor Fleury introduce this motion. Uh, it is, uh, I think, uh, or on behalf of the FCA Transportation Committee, um, certainly uh, worthy of support. It is, um, these are two important issues that the city needs to address. So thank you for that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cullen. Are there any questions for the delegation? Seeing none, thank you very much. Uh, Trevor Hache. Thank you, Chair, members of the Transportation Committee. Um, I just want to be empathetic to your experience. Um, I found myself uh, reading this morning the Term of Council Priorities for the first time, and just feels like there's so much coming at us all the time. Um, 
So I can only imagine it's probably 100 times worse for all of you at a minimum. Um, but a couple of quick thoughts um, that I wanted to share. It, it seems as though there's um, opportunities to add more details within the Term of Council priorities, specifically related to transportation. Um, I know uh, in the election this past fall, uh, none other than the mayor had a plan to uh, get an electric bus pilot project going in Ottawa. We were very supportive of that, and uh, it's good to know that there's a small pilot being planned. We know, given the climate crisis, that we need to electrify the bus fleet much more quickly. Um, and so I wondered if there'd be any appetite for perhaps including a specific reference to that in the Terminal Council priorities. Um, we had gathered significant community support for the idea that the uh, bus fleet could be 100% electrified by 2035 um, and that starting in 2024, Ottawa would purchase only electric buses. So by significant community support, I mean that over 2,000 people signed a petition addressed to the city asking for those specific things. It would be great if there was any appetite for you know, putting those into the term of council priorities. Um, because we know, uh, you know, LRT uh, 2 is coming, uh, LRT 1 has been launched, uh, but we need uh, great buses, right, feeding people into the LRT stations. Uh, and there are many areas of the city that won't necessarily be super well connected to uh, the rapid transit stations. And so we do still need a very high functioning uh, bus network, and the city spends a lot of money on diesel for its buses, so um, perhaps um, there, there may or may not be appetite for integrating some type of a commitment to that in there. Um, maybe it's too last minute to add to um, what's being proposed today, but maybe between now and when this uh, rises to council, some thought could be given to, to that. The other thing I just uh, wanted to reflect on was it seems like there's a lot of interest in autonomous vehicles. Um, we don't have those yet, uh, but it seems staff time is being dedicated to working with stakeholders on that. There may come a time when those are a reality. Um, there's some really disturbing ideas coming out of the business interest promoting that idea, which is that you know sidewalks could be fenced off to prevent people from walking out across a road um, so that the autonomous vehicle would be less likely to hit people unless the autonomous vehicle was sort of, um, you know, specifically keyed into those safe crossing areas. Um, so we need to be cautious about putting too much hope into autonomous vehicles solving all of our transportation solutions. And, and there's something that would work really well in solving some of these last mile connections, which is a bike sharing program in Ottawa. I'd much rather see a commitment in the Term of Council priorities to reestablishing a bike sharing program in Ottawa than um, putting too much time or energy into autonomous vehicles in the current Term of Council. Because I think we know uh, bikes are a proven technology that have been with us for many, many decades, whereas autonomous vehicles do not really exist. Um, so there's a, a hole right now in the transportation network in Ottawa, I would say, that um, has been left by the ending of the bike sharing. So I don't know if that's something that could be incorporated into the transportation master plan or if it could be a term of council priority, but I do think it would help the city achieve its transportation goals. Um, and certainly, the idea that I mentioned earlier was that we need really a network of streets that work well for public transit vehicles as well as people who walk or bike. And if we were to, you know, commit in the Term of Council priorities to creating a network that, uh, that was for safe streets, healthy streets, complete streets, specifically for uh, buses, uh, for people walking, using wheelchairs, um, I think we would... Uh, increase the economic uh, opportunities uh, of Ottawa's businesses and make it a much more attractive place for employees of Shopify and, and others. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions for the delegation? Uh, seeing none, thank you very much. <clears throat> I do have a speaker's list, uh, Councillor Lieber. Thank you, and uh, I'll keep it relatively brief. Uh, I actually just want to pick up on a point that Mr. Hache has just raised. So in the term of council priorities on page 20, uh, we speak to the role of autonomous vehicles under our transportation uh, priorities. And uh, for those who uh, may not have read it, the action is to support our stakeholders in the advancement of the city's autonomous vehicles initiative. I think I'm on the same page as Mr. Hache in terms of wanting to hear more from the city about how we're thinking about autonomous vehicles within our transportation network. The AV test track that we have is by all accounts world leading. It is generating significant economic activity in the city. Uh, I'm, I congratulate uh, the, uh, everyone who is involved with that. But it strikes me as being something that is best put under our finance and economic development priorities. How are we going to develop the, the economy of this city as opposed to a transportation priority? I think there are a lot of us who would assert that um, our transportation priority for the city needs to be public transit, walking, cycling. Those are the keys to achieving a sustainable transportation system in Ottawa. What are transportation staff thinking about the role of AVs in our transportation system and trying to make that more sustainable? Because I, I don't want to take I don't want to look too far into the future because the, the technology is still very, it's iffy. Um, you know, we, we see some pretty alarming stuff around AVs. What, what role do you see it playing? Uh, Chair, I believe the, uh, the response to your question, Councillor, comes in two parts. So on the uh, higher level transportation planning aspect, uh, through the TMP, we're going to look at this technology. It is coming down. The um, it's going to be here in the future. So we're going to look at uh, and establish the framework, how we can pick out the benefits, the value of that technology and how it can help um, you know, with mobility for those that cannot uh, uh, drive or cannot take a, um, a bus or have other mobility challenges. So we have to be prepared for that from the policy perspective. How can we use that technology to help with mobility and, and keep our network also sustainable? The second part of your question relates to actually the, the work that the city is doing on technology and why it's in the transportation side rather than economic development. But they, they all link together with economic development, but because of the, the lead um, in the, the, what you see here in the term of council uh, priority, I'm going to pass it over to Mr. Landry to, to respond. So in terms of, of the initiatives that were and why it's in this group is, is the intent was to ensure that, you know, we have a, a state-of-the-art traffic control system uh, that communicates with all our traffic lights uh, and we've spent a lot of time and effort to ensure that we're always at the threshold of, uh, or beyond where where most municipalities are. So we know this is coming down the pipe and at this point we're, we're putting in resources to test the technologies. So we were the first city to live um, test uh, infrastructure from a traffic light to a vehicle. So we want to continue to work on that because we see opportunities in the future where a vehicle may talk to our traffic signal so instead of having detectors in the road you won't need one. It'll know that the you know, the vehicle, it be a bus or a car or, or whatever, um, is approaching the intersection, so it'll, it'll reduce potential costs from that perspective. We also, um, you know, it's got a big economic development, like you mentioned, um, and we want to ensure that, you know, we are participating on that. We've got our infrastructure there, so we want to provide that support uh, because there's not many cities in the, in the world that have that ability to, uh, in real time, provide information uh, to, uh, to manufacturers and industry. Uh, and we're also going to be piloting, uh, I know out in the Canada test track, we're going to be having a smart intersection where we have um, companies coming in with their products at our traffic light to be able to detect, um, you know, um, pedestrians or cyclists or vehicles. Uh, we'll have some things that are in the asphalt to detect temperatures and they're all connected to one so it all becomes an ecosystem. So those are the kind of projects that's focused in here. Uh, this also ties into our traffic, transportation system management plan that was approved uh, back in 2012 or 2013 where one of the emphasis areas was working with technology and innovation. So this aligns very well with, with that. Okay. I, I just want to make sure that as the years go by we're not um, 
we're not pinning a lot of hopes on autonomous vehicle technology and associated technologies to make our transportation system sustainable and safe because there are a couple of references to it as well in the Road Safety Action Plan, uh, but that we continue to keep our eye on the ball of um, uh, well-designed streets and getting cars off the road through public transit, walking, and cycling. All right, thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Are there any other uh, questions uh, to staff? Councillor Bernard? Uh, sorry, thanks, Chair. Um, just to, to the, the point made about the bike sharing program, it's a disappointment that that is no longer in our city now. Um, can you give me information on and how we might get a bike share program back in Ottawa and operating? I know that the, the scooters uh, we're looking, it looks like something like that may come eventually, uh, but can you give me more information about how, how we can facilitate re the return of a bike share program in the city? Uh, Chair, RTMP, the current one, and probably the next one too, will continue to have the policies to support those kinds of modes of uh, transportation. So uh, it's just that we are not putting in the dollars in to um, manage and be responsible for the program because there are private, uh, in the private sector, there are those that can provide that. So uh, our focus has been to dedicate the funding towards building the infrastructure and having somebody else provide the, um, the, the, the service and operate it and maintain it and so on for those bikes. So currently we do not have any plans for the city to take on that role as the, the provider of bike share, but it's open to anybody who wishes to come to the city and provide that uh, service. Just a follow up to that if I can, Mr. Chair. Um, when was the decision made to say that the city wasn't gonna do that but we were gonna rely on uh, private sector? Oh, it's been that way for quite some time because the first uh, bike share program was initiated by the NCC. So, um, and then that morphed into um, I forgot the, the vendor's name, but and then th this group then decided to, to not uh, return uh, and set up shop uh, this past year. It just seems to me, if all of our goals are to try to get people, again, walking, biking, taking transit, it may make strategic sense for us to, especially if it's fairly cost neutral, uh, strategic sense for us to try to set something up, because then we're not at the whim of a corporation who may or may not want to stay here or place them in certain areas where um, we'd like to see them in other areas, uh, that sort of thing. So is there not a strategic goal uh, that would, it, this would match up with in terms of us trying to get more um, of this type of transportation going in the city because it's a cost savings for taxpayers? Um, if I can just step back in, in history and just give you a bit of a background how the first pilot project, that pilot, bike share pilot program began. Um, so the NCC took that on and, but before they did, they brought in an expert, Jan Gell from Copenhagen. He came and he looked at the city and he said that uh, we have a very high bike ownership here already in the city. And he said that we should be focusing our funds on building the safe infrastructure. The NCC went ahead to test the pilot uh, program for bike share and it was supposed to last for five years. It only lasted for three, I believe. And then, and then they sold that uh, to, to the other vendor who continued on for a while. So it does require funding to, to operate, particularly in the um, uh, first few years. And uh, from what I know from other cities, that it, is, it continues to require funding. It's not really a break even. And we would like to see bike share actually in the suburbs as part of that last mile whereas um, a lot of uh, companies like to have it in the downtown because that's where the people are. And, but in the downtown, it's already walkable and we have um, good transit service. So, so we will try to develop policies to encourage this, but right now we don't have a plan to take this on. But that, let's see how the TMP unfolds and how we can uh, get people to move around. Okay, and no companies have shown interest lately. Uh, hasn't been something on your radar in terms of companies that have talked to you about it or anything? Um, I was looking for Court Curry because they would approach him. He's responsible for the right of way and that's where um, the, the, uh, the, the contract and agreements are made through his shop. I don't recall. Oh, he's right, he's right here, there. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yes, Chair. I can advise that we've been approached by three, uh, three bike sharing companies in the last year. Uh, we had two that were interested in operating this year, but ultimately, as Ms. Chi said, chose not to, uh, to pursue, despite the fact that, as you recall, we did put uh, a framework in front of committee earlier this year um, that would provide those companies to operate on our right of way. Okay. I just think if, if, it, if, it, if it's a bit of a cost for us, it's worth it in some cases if more people start to bike because it's such a savings for us when people do that, right? Taxpayers save money when, when people bike. So um, it, uh, it is something I think we should potentially look at bringing in-house. I, 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 I don't think we should continue on to say if at a company's whim, it should be something we do. If I, I'll work with you and, and talk with you some more about this. Um, and just see if we can't look at uh, a potential change in that. If it has to bring a motion, that's fine. I'll, I'll work on it. But I think leaving it up to one company to decide yay or nay to this doesn't seem to make sense when, especially in the suburban areas, there's a lot of areas where we could use this type of infrastructure. So uh, I'd like to work with you some more on that. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much. Are there any other uh, questions or comments? Uh, seeing none. Um, that the Transportation Committee consider the actions under its mandate as outlined in document one. And oh, I pardon me, uh, Councillor Fleury's motion. Uh, Councillor Fleury's motion, uh, therefore, be resolved that the City of Ottawa reaffirms and identifies this downtown heavy truck traffic issue as a term of council priority that is in dire need of solution. And further, be resolved the City of Ottawa work closely with the federal government on its reinitiation of a new interprovincial crossing study and other related studies pertaining to strategic transportation planning between the two provinces. So motion carried. 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 Thank you. Thank you. And on the term of council priorities. Carried. Carried. Thank you. The next item is number three, which is the budget. And uh, we do have a presentation. Uh, Isabel Jasmine, the deputy city treasurer. Uh, Vivi Chi, Director of Transportation Planning, Phil Landry, uh, Director of Traffic Services, Layla Gibbons, Director of Roads and Parking Services, uh, Public Works and Environmental Services, and Alain Gonchier, who is the Director of Infrastructure Services. All right, perfect. Good afternoon and thank you to the chair and members of the Transportation Committee for giving us the opportunity to present today. I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, Isabel Jasmine, Vivi Chi, Phil Landry, and Alain Gontier. We're here today to share the highlights of the Transportation Committee draft budget. So the focus of today's presentation is to review the operating and capital budgets from Public Works and Environmental Services, Transportation Services, innovative client services, and planning, infrastructure, and economic development. So the total operating budget for uh, this committee is um, $305 million in expenditures for a net tax requirement of 188 million point six. Um, if we go line by line, the GM business support services, the net tax requirement is 10.7 million. Uh, road services, which includes winter and road maintenance, um, has expenditures of 131.2 million, and there's recoveries uh, primarily from parking, stormwater, and transit for a net requirement of 117.7. Parking services uh, is on a 100% cost recovery basis. Uh, the, the expenditure budget for that one is 17 million. 
Transportation planning, the net uh, requirement is 4.4 million. Traffic services, um, the net requirement for that one is 52 million, 52.1 million. And fleet services, um, the expenditure budget for 2019 is 80.9 million, uh, and uh, those services are recovered from other departments. So overall, the roads budget is increasing by $7.9 million. Some of the key highlights of the proposed roads budget include a $1.2 million adjustment for com compensation uh, for the 2020 cost of living, wage and salary increments, and benefit adjustments, $1.3 million in inflationary increases to contracted services, materials, supplies, and fleet. There's a $3.1 million base adjustment to the winter maintenance budget, which includes adjustments for road modifications and the cycling network program. There's a $600,000 base budget increase to the asphalt repair program, bringing the total budget for the program to $9.8 million. The 2020 draft budget also includes $1.5 million in growth funding for additional maintenance of roadways, sidewalks, and pathways. There are 7.34 FTEs associated with this growth, along with $930,000 in capital funding for new vehicles and equipment. Looking at parking services, the draft budget includes $1.1 million in growth funding, which will be offset by increased revenue as with the 2019 Municipal Parking Management Strategy refresh and the governance review report that was recently brought to committee and council. Included in this draft budget are three FTEs, which will be key contributors in establishing a program as we develop the bike parking strategy. So specifically for road services winter operations, there's a $5.6 million budget increase for 2020, bringing the total budget for winter operations to $78.3 million. This represents a 7.7% increase when compared to the 2019 budget. Moving into 2020, if the draft budget is passed as, as it is presented, the winter operations budget will be adequately funded to reflect the actual expenditures over the past three years, so 2016 to 2018. There's also one-time funding commitment uh, of $250,000 contained within the draft budget these funds will be uh, used to begin the review of the winter operations uh, maintenance quality standards, which will focus on residential roads and our sidewalk network. So the total draft uh, budget for capital uh, for this committee is 337.4 million. 73% uh, of that is for renewal projects, primarily in fleet, transportation, and integrated roads, water, and wastewater. Uh, the next um, area is for growth, um, in primarily for transit and transportation services. And then there's a six, about $6.8 million, which is 2% of the overall capital budget um, for ser service enhancements. So this um, reflects the overall funding sources. Um, of the $337.4 million. Uh, because this is primarily uh, renewal, a, a, lot, a lot of, 75% of the, um, the budget is for renewal projects. Much of it comes from cash reserves. So 62.2% comes from cash reserves. And those are funds that are contributed to the reserves as part of the operating budget each year. Debt, 17.3%, uh, and then development charges on the growth projects of 20.5% uh, or $69.3 million. Okay, um, this slide is about uh, the um, accounts that are under transportation planning, so it's mostly, well, they're all growth. Um, the big items are the $41 million to um, continue funding the Strandherd Drive uh, widening, and 4.2 million was the last installment that we need to keep um, funding, uh, to finalize the uh, funding for the Canada South Link so it can continue with its construction. 7.25 million is for intersection control measures and network modification programs, so that's to help in, improve uh, capacity around uh, intersections uh, where growth is happening for development. And then uh, 13.9 million is for um, tra the transit priority networks, transit corridor protection, park and ride facilities, and, and planning studies. So that is uh, related to the transit side. 
9.1 million we've uh, earmarked for active transportation, and that includes a whole bunch of different programs that you see listed there. And the major structures program, we've got funding there of uh, 1.95. Um, it's been being bundled with the stage two project for the um, Rideau River crossing at Carleton University. Then the last one that I have here is two million for um, uh, traffic calming for neighborhoods of local streets. This has been increased from past funding of uh, only about 600K. So this is a substantial increase and we hope to maintain it at that level in the next few years. Okay. In terms of uh, the capital highlights for the traffic services area, so there's the $4 million one-time funding for the road safety action plan that was approved earlier today. Uh, we have 2.4 million for the new traffic control so devices, so this allows us to um, do construction at Barnesdale and Prince of Wales, as well as Huntmar and Richards Side Road uh, next year, as well as a pedestrian signal at Laurier and Percy. We have just over a million dollars for safety improvement programs. Um, then we have 600,000 for the audible and pedestrian countdown signal programs, uh, 420,000 for Safe Roads Ottawa, uh, 380,000 for the pedestrian safety program, uh, 105 thousand dollars for cycling safety which allows us to make enhancements to 10 locations uh, we also have the pxo program for half a million dollars and then there's the 50 million sorry the fifty thousand dollars per ward uh, led temporary traffic measures i'd also note in our operating budget we also have asked for 10 uh, growth for 10 new crossing guard locations So from an infrastructure services perspective, the transportation assets are valued at over $13 billion uh, in value, and that accounts for approximately 6,000 kilometres of road, 650 bridges, 2,700 kilometres of sidewalks and pathways, and the facilities that are required to support the delivery of uh, quality transportation services. Les infrastructures de la ville sont sécuritaires, et nous appuyons une, ou nous utilisons une approche de gestion de risque Um, et veillons à ce que les priorités soient données aux infrastructures qui sont les plus critiques. Uh, in terms of managing the vast transportation network, we do apply uh, recognized industry practices and we're continually looking at ways of improving how we're building roads, maintaining roads, and also renewing, renewing those assets. So a few highlights uh, that I wanted to point out uh, in terms of what's in the Transportation Committee budget. Uh, we have 51 million that's allocated for resurfacing of roads, which also includes preservation treatments, uh, rural road upgrades, and guide rails. And about half of those investments are in our rural wards. Uh, we have 35 million that's allocated to renewing existing bridges, and those are bridges that uh, uh, cut across the city. Uh, we have 3 million that uh, is allocated for standalone sidewalk and pathway repair. Uh, and I emphasize the standalone because there's also uh, sidewalks that are uh, also renewed as part of the reconstruction projects. Uh, finally, we have 111 million uh, that's allocated for uh, the reconstruction of roads, that's basically integrated projects where we're uh, reconstructing the road, the road, the water mains, and the, uh, and the sewers. Uh, the most significant project in uh, 2020 is uh, Montreal Road from uh, essentially North River Road to Saint Laurent Boulevard, a multi-year project. Uh, but we also have a number of other projects as listed on this uh, slide that covers different parts of the, uh, the city. Um, last note, um, earlier this year we um, implemented a new online uh, interactive map on Ottawa.ca that provides information all of the current and planned construction projects So we certainly encourage um, residents to avail themselves of that uh, of that opportunity to be able to see what is planned in their community and that concludes our presentation and we're open up to questions thank you very much uh, we do have uh, some delegations but just quickly before uh, on the last slide mr. Gauthier, um their uh, 174 slope stabilization was indicated as one of the one of the projects could you elaborate just very quickly for us on that yeah, we've allocated about a million dollar for the stabilization of the 174, uh, the section that's along the Water River that uh, over the 2017 and 2019 floods uh, has seen uh, significant erosion impacts where we were able to address on an emergency basis. But after the water receded, there were additional areas that were identified uh, in terms of uh, continued erosion that we need to address.
And this, this is the part of the highway that had previously actually fallen into the river about 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, there are different sections where we've had to go in and stabilize it. So it's uh, slightly different sections, but still part of the, the same corridor. Perfect. Thanks very much. Uh, our first uh, public delegation is uh, Ken Holmes. Thank you, Mr. Holmes, for coming. I think you've uh, presented to committee before. I think you, you look very familiar. And so uh, you have five minutes, and I'll try to give you a wave uh, when you have about 30 seconds left. Uh, can we get rid of that lower uh, slide set? Okay, thank you. I'm Ken Holmes, a resident of West Carleton. I remain concerned about the deteriorated condition of our roads for three main reasons. First of all, as a taxpayer, uh, I've invested in an inventory that we now uh, assess at a value of about 13 billion, and I want that value retained. Automotive associations advise me that the deteriorated condition of our roads uh, is costing me as a car owner an additional $300 a year in maintenance and repair. And thirdly, the further delays in conducting routine and preventive maintenance is resulting in costs that could be up to four times greater than had they been executed in a timely manner. This pie chart summarizes the overall state of the inventory of our roads as of 2011. The condition of the roads is not good. Ottawa establishes a state of good repair as the standard, yet almost three quarters of the inventory is below this condition. And more than half of our roads are classified as being in poor to very poor condition. We should be particularly concerned about the amount of road inventory that's in the poor and very poor condition as the remaining useful life is really quite limited. Many are beyond the ability to simply repair and will need to rebuild. Had we dealt with these roads at an earlier stage, i.e. had we sufficiently budgeted for that uh, activity, routine maintenance could have helped extend their life at a fraction of the investment uh, that will now be required to rebuild the road. And some estimate at a cost increase approaching 400% of what routine maintenance would be. As we were regularly reminded by the National Capital Heavy Construction Association, pay me now or pay me later. After many years of deferred maintenance, we must now heavily pay, or we must now pay heavily as a consequence. What significant growth of the roads budget will we need to afford these rebuilds? The Canadian Infrastructure Report Card, uh, to which I was directed by staff, uh, gives some significant guidance in this area as it helps decision makers identify problems in their public infrastructure programs and suggest solutions to, adjust, to address them. One of their useful guides is a yardstick to estimating the annual reinvestment required to maintain the road's infrastructure. In an oversimplification, they say that about 2% of the value of the infrastructure needs to be reinvested on an annual basis if we hope to avoid a decline over the long period. Since amalgamation, we've only invested about half that amount. Is it any wonder that much of our road inventory is in poor condition? Looking at some benchmarks, the average Canadian city is spending about 1.1% of the value of their roads infrastructure. Ottawa would likely have to spend more than the average due to our difficult winters and 
as long as we're playing catch up from years of neglect of the roads. So how much does road maintenance budget uh, for Ottawa, or how does it compare uh, with other cities? From the, uh, from the draft budget and information the staff has given me, uh, I can't definitively determine how much money is being directed strictly to road maintenance as the budget document rolls up road sidewalks and other structures into a single item. Looking at the red arrow, well, I'm encouraged that the budget this year is the third consecutive budget that allocates a notable increase. We are still only spending about half of the CIRC recommended amount. A glance at the blue arrow, that's the long range financial plan 2002 figure, shows a plan to fund road maintenance at 1.5%. I have confidence in that figure because it was developed as a result of review of the detailed documents from the 11 former municipalities. If we were estimating we needed 1.5% 15 years ago, how can we do with one third less today? To conclude, I do not have confidence that we have brought, that we will be able to bring up most of Ottawa's roads to a good standard within seven to 10 years. We don't have a focal plan that I can see to do so. We have a comprehensive asset management plan, and that provides excellent overall management for the city's infrastructure, but we need focus. My main recommendation today is that we need an approved plan to properly manage the return of our roads to an acceptable condition. We need a roads get well program that prioritizes the work across all the areas, includes a good set of measurable performance targets, and is adequately funded. Such a plan would likely be part of the comp comprehensive asset management plan, but it would allow residents and staff the benefit of focus on a major significant deficiency in the city, the condition of our roads. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Um, Councillor El Shantiri has a question. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Holm, for making uh, making the journey to uh, to present to the committee today. Uh, obviously, uh, we heard your presentation before, and some of the number I'm not sure if. Uh, but I would ask staff, with your permission, Mr. Chair, to verify some of the number we've seen because uh, there is an increase in the road budget year after year. I believe we do have a plan. Uh, we can reach it in seven years. Mr. Holm was in my budget meeting and asked specific to a staff. So if Mr. Chair, if staff can verify some of the number and the plan we have to catch up. Yeah, Chair, in, in terms of the plan that councils are already approved in 2017, which is the comprehensive asset man management plan that Mr. Holm referenced, uh, that document is very much aligned with the long range financial plan. And what that, uh, what the asset management plan shows that it, it, there is a shortfall in terms of investments. Uh, I would caution that it's not just in roads, uh, it's also uh, other tax supported assets or buildings or parks or, or sidewalks. Um, and that plan identifies basically the level of investment that should be uh, achieve on an annual basis to be able to keep our state, our, our assets in a state of good repair. Now, when we say in a state of good repair, it doesn't mean that everything is suddenly going to be in, in the green in terms of good condition. It's just basically that our roads continue to be safe um, in terms of supporting the, the delivery of their, uh, of their service and their intended purpose. Uh, so the plan that council already has is a plan to get them to uh, stability uh, and where we're able to catch up with the rate of deterioration. It doesn't, but it doesn't mean that suddenly all of the roads are gonna be, have been repaved in all immaculate condition. It just means that we're able to manage the rate of deterioration at that point. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gonsi. Mr. Holm, uh, I have asked you before and I'll ask you again. Do you have uh, any idea about a you know, cost-saving measure where we, or do you have an idea how much 
uh, we know we can spend more. We just heard all day long we can spend a lot more when we are spending on everything, but there's an afford affordability in place as well. So do you have any idea uh, where we can bring that funding to, to meet to make our road in better shape, which is something I would love to see as I, I have more road in my area than any other councillor in the city. I think the challenge is not to, just to the, the residents and the taxpayers, but it's also to council and the councillors uh, to have an array of options. So if we recognize, and I think as a result of discussions that I heard at the, uh, the last election, the majority of the councillors and the mayor are acknowledging that our roads are in bad shape and need to be improved. Well, that needs to be translated and transferred to the appropriate staff to get concurrence that there is a problem, to recognize and accept what are reasonable objectives and, and goals, and then have the staff present some options. Uh, I know the staff has, uh, has changed some of their technical solutions to, to repaving the rural roads, and that seems to be a good solution. It is workable, uh, and it is cost-saving. We probably have other, other opportunities for that, but that needs to be all part of a package that staff can present back to the Transportation Committee, back to Council, to say, here are some options that you can consider amongst which to choose the best solution. Uh, it's not reasonable to come to the average taxpayer and say, you know, what is your solution? That's why we have a huge city staff and a competent council chamber to understand those okay, problems, Mr. be Holmes. aware of options, and make decisions. Okay, Mr. Holmes, staff did give us the option, and council and the mayor choose to seal that a 3% tax increase, and I think most of us can live with that, but at the same time, the affordability plan has to be uh, in place. Uh, but since you don't have any idea, I thank you for coming and give us your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Are there any other questions uh, for the delegate? Seeing none. Uh, thank you uh, for coming in and spending your day with us here. Um, I have next a member of the Accessibility Advisory Committee. There is no name and they aren't coming. So after that, we have uh, Trevor Hache. So I've just got a video I'd love to show first, if possible. <laughs> Is it possible to pause my time while the technology gets sorted? Thank you. Hague Drive in Ottawa, and um, we've really been having a lot of trouble the last few winters with the city and sidewalk clearing. Um, we try to be patient and understanding if it's still snowing, but um, you know, we take Abby to school in her wheelchair, and it's really a struggle to get her there a lot of mornings. And the longer the uh, sidewalk clearers wait, the more the ice builds up and it gets a little melty. Um, and it's just, it's really difficult to get her to school. Abby loves school um, and uh, is disappointed yeah. when we can't go. So, yeah. hi, yeah, do you like school? Who brings you to school? Yeah. Mom brings you to school, yeah. So sometimes it's really a struggle to get her there, especially to get her there on time. Um, and, you know, we just, we, I think that it's not just us. Um, there are a lot of people out in the city that have, um, that have mobility issues. Excuse me. 
there are a lot of people in this city who struggle with mobility uh, and who can't get out of their houses. They can't do the things that they need to do in the day. So um, I would love for the city to really prioritize our sidewalks and, and you know, take better care of, of their citizens. You know, this week was really a struggle so far um, and it's just starting. I mean, it's the middle of November. So, uh, you know, I'm already tired thinking about the struggles that it's gonna be this winter if the city isn't better at getting the sidewalks cleared more quickly so that people can get out and live their lives and contribute to their communities. So yeah, just a, such a great video that um, basically emphasizes the fact that we need to do more, we need to do better, and I know that uh, People here at City Hall aren't bad people, but uh, I humbly submit that sometimes bad decisions are being made. And one of them is to prioritize at a higher degree of a service standard the roads over the sidewalks in terms of snow clearing. So we know that to bring the sidewalks up to the same standard would cost about $7 million a year, which isn't actually much money when you consider a multiple billion dollar budget. We know that uh, the city has this commitment to equity and inclusion and the equity and inclusion lens should be applied to every single decision made here at City Hall. And so it's unclear how that was made with regard to these two level of standards. We have been suggesting that the city could take a more equitable approach to bring the sidewalks up to this higher standard, the, the class 1A standard. And we also think it'd be worth doing a cost-benefit analysis of the cost incurred by the city for slip, fall, and vehicle damage liabilities compared to how much it would cost to just sort of bring the standards up. We know that uh, many of us visited City Hall in March. Uh, so the story on the left there was from the 2019 budget discussions at this committee. And many of us left feeling disappointed that we're gonna have to wait three years for this service standard review to take place. We were grateful that the draft budget included a commitment to spend $2.9 million more on the sidewalks. We just need another 4.1 million to bring it up to the class 1A standard. So that's what I'm urging this committee to voice their support for and to uh, make it happen. I know that with political will, this money could be found. I'm urging all of the people on this committee with the power to bring that political will to the table to do so. We'll benefit greatly from hearing from Stephen later, who's highlighted in this Ottawa Citizen story on the right. He had an awful experience last winter. And John Woodhouse, who's on the board of the Healthy Transportation Coalition, he was here uh, previously as well today. And he's often having to take his motorized wheelchair onto the road because the sidewalks are impo impassable, literally putting his life at risk. This is another story from this past February. We know it was a bad winter. And we know that um, when standards aren't the same for the roads and the sidewalks, people that face multiple barriers, uh, their lives are made even worse. So there's been good media coverage on this issue in the past, and um, this is from 2017, where the snow-clogged sidewalks were leaving some Ottawa residents housebound. And this article talked about a woman who was worried she was gonna start running out of food because it was so bad. There is a commitment to equity in Ottawa uh, at City Hall, which is great. Um, it would be great if uh, Ottawa could learn from what Stockholm is doing, which is that they've decided to emphasize and prioritize the clearing of sidewalks because it's a gender issue, a gender equity issue for them. So we would urge Ottawa to adopt a similar policy. And many people, hundreds of people have voiced their support for these needed improvements. Um, we had other budget priorities. Uh, some of them were addressed, but I've run out of time, so I'll just leave it there. Uh, thanks very much uh, for the presentation. Are there any questions? Yeah, Councillor Menard. Thanks very much, Chair. Thank you for your presentation. Um, the figure that you had cited there, the seven million figure, did that come from staff, or was that previous uh, information? Yeah. Yeah, Kevin Wiley and I had some correspondence via email because um, I found it frustrating as a resident not 
getting clear answers from the good people here uh, in the past on how much it would cost to actually fix the situation. And through that correspondence, I learned that it's around $7 million. I think you know, it, it's not 100% accurate, and it might take years before we get a 100% accurate number, but that's the best uh, guess, and I think we should take the next best step and we should do this because yeah, I that's thought it was the best about information five, we have. Uh, from what I was hearing, I thought it was a five annually. Um, that helps clarify. The class 1A standard, so that would be right down to the, the uh, pavement, right? It, uh, no, no like inch of snow or anything on top there. Is that, is that correct? That's my understanding. I'm not a sidewalk clearing maintenance expert, but my understanding is that it's the same standard as what's being applied to the roads. And it would basically just mean that whenever there's a heavy snowfall, crews are out quickly clearing that snow and they're not letting it accumulate and they're bringing it down to, yeah, as close to a bare surface as is possible. Okay. And have you engaged with um, city staff about uh, the MQS update, the timing of that, and in the meantime, what changes may be occurring to sidewalks? Um, I know there's some implementation of some changes happening. Uh, which I'm hoping are going to be positive. I'm looking forward to seeing some results from it. Um, but have you talked to them about the difference between what you're asking for and what we may achieve this this year? Um, you know, I'm aware of the things that you've just mentioned happening. I'm aware that there's a desire to improve things from from where things were at last winter, which was horrendous. Um, I'm aware that there's an extra 2.9 million dollars proposed in the budget specifically for improving sidewalks. Okay. Um, I think to get to where we need to go, we need that $7 million. So it's $4.1 million more than what was proposed in the draft budget. We're grateful that there's a commitment to try to improve things, but we think to actually be to where we need to be so that people uh, who face enough challenges in their lives, frankly, don't need um, more okay. imposed on them. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Thank you, Councillor uh, Councillor Lubov. If the chair would indulge, I'm wondering if uh, if Mr. Landry might be able to spend a moment uh, talking about the review that was done this summer and what uh, upgrades to our uh, to our program uh, when it comes to clearing sidewalks uh, has accomplished over the course. Uh, of, of the summer and what we're about to, to embark upon this uh, this winter. I, I'll actually take that one. That was through road services. So we did complete a service delivery review this past summer. We did hear loud and clear um, from our residents, uh, from the councillors on the concerns that we have had over the past years, particularly through the extreme winter conditions last year. Um, we, did, uh, we did come to a committee with a number of changes that we're going to be putting into place this year ahead of the maintenance quality standard review. Uh, some of it is um, we've redeployed over 50 staff to ensure that we now have 24-7 coverage on our sidewalk networks uh, during and after a storm. It is still within our maintenance quality standards. So yes, the uh, class one is bare pavement. Other classes are a snowpack. But with, um, with having the redeployment to overnight services, we are able to get onto the sidewalk network sooner during a, an event to hopefully not get to the conditions that we've seen in the past. Uh, some of the other things that we're doing, we've moved away from a one-size-fits-all approach. We're now empowering our supervisors to make the decisions on when to deploy based on the conditions that they're seeing in their areas, as well as creating hot spots. So uh, we initially started to look at just catch basins and we quickly realized that we need to add in areas where there are mobility concerns, um, seniors' homes, schools, things like that, and we're documenting it on our hotspot map so that we can offer some additional care during those events. Um, also, we've purchased some more sidewalk clearing equipment in terms of the icebreakers, and we're piloting uh, a hatch blade, which should help alleviate some of the, the concerns with ice and hard pack snow. And very quickly, over the course of the next few years, while we're waiting for this review to be completed, uh, is there still room for further improvement? Absolutely. What uh, We're getting away from doing reviews and uh, making the changes and then shelving it. For us, it's, it's in terms of continuous improvement. We want to hear what the concerns are. We want to hear from our residents, particularly through the consultation process that we will be starting next year for the maintenance quality uh, service review. We will ask 
individuals to come out and talk to us about what, what they're seeing, what they're wanting, so that we can come back to Council with a very fulsome report. Let's make sure that uh, Mr. Hashe's group is involved in that review. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. I have uh, Christine Santelli from Cowie. Christine. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair Blais and all the members of the committee. My name is Christine Santoli. I am a resident of Vanier, um, a member and a volunteer with CAWI, City for All Women Initiative and the Healthy Transportation Coalition. I want to thank you for the 2.9 million more for winter maintenance in the City of Ottawa draft budget 2020 that was dedicated to sidewalk clearing. But today, I'm here to emphasize the need to invest 4.1 million more to bring the snow clearing at a class, class 1A standard for all sidewalks in Ottawa. This would ensure that pedestrians and people who use wheelchair can get around safely in the winter. I would also bring the increase in sidewalk clearing up to a total amount of $7 million a year, the amount that is needed to ensure that Ottawa is accessible to everyone. To emphasize the importance of this investment, I want to draw your attention to the condition of snow and ice clearing on the sidewalk and at the bus stop. Many times last year I had to walk on the road because the sidewalk was not cleared of the snow or there was no salt or sand when it was covered of ice. I was worried about my safety as a pedestrian and was worried about getting injured due to a falling or slipping. During the winter of 2018 and 19, I was trapped a few times in my house, unable to access transit, grocery stores, and other services due to a lack of snow removal and salt or sand on the sidewalk. Last year, the snow bank were sometimes two feet high or and more in front of the bus stop. I had to ask someone to help me enter the bus and to get out of the bus to make sure I didn't fall. Snow ice clearing severely impact my ability to move around the city during the winter. This is what I would like to see from the Transportation Committee. Bring the snow clearing standard of the sidewalk in the City of Ottawa to a class, class 1A standard. Commit a $7 million a year to bring winter sidewalk maintenance to a class 1A standard each year starting in the budget 2020. Take an equitable approach to snow clearing redevelop the snow clearing schedule to prioritize sidewalk clearing over road clearing and prioritize the mobility of Ottawa most vulnerable residents. Thank you for listening and I'm waiting for the, your decision in response to my concern and the concern of my communi committee. community. Thank you. Uh, merci, Christine, uh, pour la présentation. Thank you uh, for the presentation. Are there any uh, questions? No, seeing none. Merci encore. Um, uh, Stephen Saint Denis. It's supposed to be a photo display. Mm -hmm. 
I will send I it around. It. You have it? What? The photo? The photo. Yeah. We're just looking for it, Stephen. Just give us uh, a minute. I have it. Because of that, I, I had to drive a car 
against the traffic on Richmond Road. So you might even call it negligence. And this was not the cause of a lack of money. This is the cause of a lack of co compliance to existing standards. Never mind the new standards. There's an existing standard. Suppose, suppose that sidewalk was a walk on your property and you pay somebody to clear that walk. Would you accept that? No. Then why did the people of Ottawa accept it? If, if citizen staff need more training or more sensitivity training, um, then so be. But that, no amount of training will fix that. That comes down to common sense. And you can't train common sense. And like I said, so the money is very important. But unless, unless you put the Unless you put measures in to make sure that there is proper training and like every organization, there are a few bad apples where you have to take actions. And as far as current Contractors go. Uh, we're getting tough when contractors say RTG and say, you're not me, you're not complying with what we agree to. They were withholding funds. And we have to get tough with all our contractors. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you, Stephen, uh, for your presentation. I think we do have a couple questions. Uh, so, Councillor Hubley uh, has a question. Thank you uh, very much for your presentation, and I agree with you. It should just be common sense for this. So, if the chair will allow, uh, maybe Lila, it, doesn't make sense to me. Like, how could a plow come down there? There's no place for the plow to turn around without completing the street. So, uh, how could something like this happen? So this the chair. Was, oh, sorry. This was that intersection. Uh, uh, if you let staff answer, they might give us a um, rationale as to how something yeah. like this could happen. Yeah, so through the chair, uh, we did, there were a few incidents that came in during uh, our first event. Um, what we're doing moving into this year is we're having pre-event meetings and post-event meetings. So we did look into all of these uh, circumstances that were brought to our attention. There was a mix of, uh, of concerns, um, whether it was broken equipment, uh, whether it was um, new staff that were on, whether it was training issues. We are looking closely at what the cause of any incidents like this was. I actually believe this one was a, a piece of equipment that broke down on that corner. Um, but we will be doing post-event uh, debriefs all the time to look at some of the concerns. Contract management is very important to us. We have done uh, some recent training with our staff to ensure that we are holding our, account our contractors accountable as well as holding our staff accountable for the works that they do. So we are taking these very seriously and, uh, and having the conversations. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And, and just to clarify, was this the Richmond Road uh, that Stephen was mentioning? Yes. Yes, okay. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Leeper. 
Thanks. I am just curious. So this is the corner of Redwood and Richmond. Yes. In front of the former strip mall, was the the Byron Path was that plowed? Do you remember? It was. Um, I can't say for sure. Okay. No, I mean, it, it just if that was plowed at the same time, then there would have been absolutely no reason not to have these last couple of feet uh, feet done. Um, thanks for showing that. I know my office will be having our usual snow meeting with the, with the team coming up soon, and uh, we'll make sure that this is raised as a part of that. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you very much. Um, Councilor Fleury has a question, but just before we go there, what is our policy on holdbacks uh, from contractors or evaluating contract performance on uh, winter operations? Uh, we, we have a process in place that uh, we've, we've had pre-meetings with the contractors, so that's phase one, and that's just to set our expectations in place. As we move on, if there are concerns with contractors, and I can't recall if this was a contractor or not, um, if there are concerns with contractors, we bring them in and we document, and then we have the ability to either withhold funds or pull the contracts. Okay, thank you, Councillor Fleur. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair, uh, for, for, city, for the staff. Um, I wonder how many different teams, how many different groups do we have that do clearing? I know I live at least two. I know the, there's, there's your team and then there's the team that does uh, parking lots in community centers or parks. Is there other teams? So you're ter in terms of uh, snow clearing around snow the clearing. city? Yeah. Uh, so you basically have the roads, uh, roads and parking services staff who manage it on roadways, sidewalks, the winter maintenance of pathways, uh, and then you have park staff who take care of parking lots and our recreation facilities, uh, fire stations, paramedic posts, libraries, things like that. So um, I believe it is only the two groups. Um, I don't believe I'm missing any unless there's uh, another group that does it just for their particular buildings. Is there a group specifically for bus stops? That actually runs through our roads and parking services team that does, manages that. Okay. I think I think there's a, some coordination. I, this is a very specific case, but I think I what I've seen is coordination issues between even internal groups and external group. We'll go do the sidewalk, then someone overnight will come and do the bus stop, which creates that environment. We get that at par city parking lots too, where we're pushing the snow in spots where it then blocks the sidewalk. So. It's a macro issue and you know, there's specific, so I'm not looking for an answer, but just maybe uh, co being cognizant of that as the MQS and as the uh, operations go, go out and seeing some, re some flags uh, continuing to be raised. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any uh, speakers or questions uh, about the budget? Councilor Menard? Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I've got two, two questions, two inquiries. Um, one is about uh, road expansions and uh, road widening. So by my read of the budget, is it just strand herd that's in there, or are there other roads that we're widening and expanding in this budget? Uh, in the 2020 budget requests, it's just those two projects that um, have um, funds uh, been requested for uh, Strand Herd and also to finish off um, Canada South Link. These are development charge funded projects. Okay. Is it just DCs that are going to them? There's no other extra 95% DCs, 5% tax. Okay. I'll ask this every budget uh, on road uh, expansions um, and widenings. Um, and we'll talk about bike lanes too. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, no need to get uh, upset. Um, <clears throat> I, I also want to just uh, discuss with you around the, the, the issues that have been raised uh, with the snow clearing uh, budget and um, uh, the deficit that we were in from last year. So I just want to clarify, the deficit from the snow clearing budget last year, was it, was it 15 million that I saw or was it a different figure than that? Are you speaking to 2019? 2019. Okay, so for the snow clearing, for the winter maintenance budget, uh, there's a predicted uh, deficit of $14.5 million. 14.5, okay. And we are adding from our baseline from last year, 3.1? 
we're adjusting the base budget by 3.1, uh, sorry, that's, the base adjustment is actually 3.463. 3.463, yeah. okay. So in your estimation, if we have a year like last year, we're still gonna be, we'll likely go over again um, by, by let's say 10 or 12 million based on last year's results. Actually, um, last year was an extreme winter. Uh, we are going into 2020, as I mentioned, if budget is passed as presented, uh, with the $7.9 million increase to our budget, which includes uh, both base adjustments and growth, we should be fully funded uh, to support the budgets that we've seen over the past three years. So the $78.3 million actually uh, sh reflects the actual expenditures that we'd seen 2016 to 2018. So if we experience a winter like we had during those three years, we should be on budget. Uh, the 20, if we do ex uh, see extreme weather conditions again this year, there is a potential that we could be in excess again, uh, hoping that with the changes that we've made through the service delivery review and how we have changed our boundaries and the way we deploy, uh, we should be able to manage the budget moving into 2020. Okay. Um, that's helpful. What, what's in our, what are we have in our reserves right now? Uh, and what will be returned there this year? I don't know if uh, there's finance. The tax stabilization reserve is expected to have $18 million in it at the end of 2020. The tax, the ta okay, okay. That's writ large? Uh, okay. The tax stabilization reserve is what you would use if we had to actually fund a winter maintenance deficit. Okay. This year, as you know, they have a deficit, but through all of the other budgets across the city, we should be able to cover it without having to go into the tax stabilization reserve. Okay, um, just theoretically then, if, if for example, we, we went forward with the, that class one on our sidewalks and we said we need that extra four million to get there, um, and that came from the tax stabilization reserve, uh, that I guess theoretically that's where it would potentially come from, depends on the motion. Or, yeah, which is also for emergencies, I understood, I understand. Um, we have side conversations happening here that you can't hear. Uh, but uh, if, uh, if, if, if we did do that, um, would, in your estimation, would we get better results on our, on our sidewalks? Would we avoid some of the situations that we're hearing delegations coming up and speaking to us about or that we're seeing pictures on? Would that be helpful? Uh, I think with some of the changes that we've made this year, particularly with having 24-7 coverage now, dedicated staff on our sidewalk network, we will see a difference in the conditions and with the equipment that we use. Um, moving into 2020, we're actually GPSing all of our sidewalk units, so we will be able to have better data to determine what the actual costs are after we've made the changes that you see in the service delivery review. Uh, so I don't, I don't know if that is a requirement at this point in time. I think it's prudent for us to come back uh, to give some better data once we have that from the GPS units on our sidewalk uh, machines this year. Okay, it's very helpful to, the, about the GPS piece. I know you've mentioned that to us as well beforehand. Um, I just think to myself, if we're gonna be dipping into that stabilization reserve, if, we do, if there is an overage, does it make sense for us to say invest in something like this in advance, which may help mitigate uh, any problems we have in the future? Because I guess to get to one, to, to that class one on our sidewalks, what does that take? Is that, does that mean we're going over it twice? And so the, just in terms of like, I'm trying to think about dollars and cents here. Is it that we have to buy more equipment to, to do that? Or we'd, we'd use our, our normal equipment, but hire more people to be using them more often? Um, what's the difference? It would absolutely take more resources. Uh, it would be getting onto the sidewalk network, network sooner and more often. Uh, and it depends on the, uh, we also in our yards at this point in time have access to salt, sand and grit. Uh, it's a possibility that there would be more use of salt uh, on our sidewalks if we had to look at bare pavement. So I think it's like, again, like I said, more prudent for us to come back with a fulsome report to let you know what those options are and what that cost would be going forward. But I think you will see a difference moving into this 2019-2020 season 
by having overnight coverage where we can access the, the sidewalk network sooner than we have been able to in the past. I'm pleased to hear about the, the overnight piece. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, and I guess, I guess it's just the, the suggestion is, is there anything that that four million could do to mitigate some of the problems we already we've had in the past winters where we've gone over? Would that help in any way mitigate some of the other costs we're seeing? I'm thinking in front of for freeze thaw cycles, for example, or in front of bus stops or areas where councillors say, look, you've got to get back out here again. We didn't do this one properly. So could that $4 million actually help mitigate some other costs? Or are you seeing it just as an, a pure add-on? Um, I think what we, we're looking at continuous improvement. So throughout the winter, we are going to make sure that we are clearing uh, the sidewalks. If we do see concerns with free thaw cycles, that may be a conversation at that point in time where we say that we may uh, be in a deficit because of the extreme conditions again. Uh, right now, it is an add-on uh, for us to schedule on top of the changes that we've made to schedule additional either staffing resources or contractors. Um, I don't think that we're in a good position right now to say that that's what's required. Um, I do want to see how these changes from service delivery review affect our sidewalk network. Um, we, we do propose that it's going to be uh, better service that's being offered moving into this winter, but we are always open to looking at other ideas as the conditions change. Okay, okay, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Dudas. I uh, had a question about the budget in respect to the vehicle replacement and the life cycle renewal. I just wanted to know if there's any plans in place as part of that life cycle or upcoming ones to introduce EV or hybrid vehicles. Uh, thank you, Chair, for the question. I'm going to invite uh, Yann St. Louis, who is our new Director of Fleet Services, to respond to your question. Sorry, I missed part of the question as I was standing up. <laughs> Sounds good. I, we wanted to know if we have a life cycle renewal for our vehicle fleet. I wanted to know if any of those coming in would be EV vehicles, and if not, what is the plan to introduce them into our, our um, fleet? So as part of the fleet coming in, we have four, our first four electric vehicles coming in. Uh, they're expected in May, May 2020. Uh, after that, we, we got a green, green fleet plan, sorry, uh, that we're just renewing now that will be coming forward uh, shortly after uh, PIDE renewed their uh, the climate emergency changes plan. On that, we'll have more details as to how we're going to move forward as far as green, uh, green fleet and EV uh, hybrid technologies, uh, alternative fuels, and how we're going to move forward to achieve these targets. So yes, we're moving forward. We're always looking at these technologies and where they're available. Uh, we're, we're going forward with them. At this point, EV hasn't been where we, we need it to be for fleet, uh, fleet use, if I can put it that way. So if we're, if we're looking to introduce some over the next little while, including uh, in the next short-term budget. Do we have money put aside in this budget, or do we have plans in upcoming budgets to provide the infrastructure? Because it's not just the vehicles we need, but it's the infrastructure to maintain them. So far, we've, I'm sorry. So far, we've been using the Greed uh, Fleet Fund uh, that's been funded from 2016 to 2018. Uh, we still have money left, so we've been using that uh, for the four uh, vehicles we're bringing, it, bringing in now. Uh, moving forward as we're going to build that fleet, uh, I believe that would be a collaboration with infrastructure uh, to build these facilities, but uh, I can't say we had those conversations yet because we had the money so far. You, you mentioned we have four coming in. I understand we have to start somewhere. How many vehicles do we have in our fleet right now, even on average? Uh, fleet, we, life, we are life cycling. We're looking at 2,700, uh, but right now technology is mostly with uh, light fleet. Uh, top of my head, I can't. Tell, but it's uh, it's a very small percentage. Okay, so you're you're saying though that as part of the climate change um, recommendations that are coming forward, I believe it's December 17th, um, and to council in January that we're going to see a bit more of a fulsome idea as to what the intent is for introducing more of these vehicles. Yeah, so the plan in December is going to come in with targets that we'll have to achieve, and based on that, we will update our plan, see how we can get there with the technology that exists today 
and we knew that uh, we're still working on the details, but we knew that every year based on the development of what's going to come forward. Okay. I, I look forward to some more concrete, and I know you're new, so <laughs> I'm not gonna, no pressure on you right now, but maybe we can get some more updates on where we're at and, and an actual plan with measurements and milestones attached to it. And if that comes as part of the climate change uh, um, report, then that would be beneficial, but it would be good to have that at least for next budget cycle. Thank you. Yes, and I do have, a, Chair, a few more numbers in front of me that to date we have 103 hybrid vehicles, four electric ice resurfacers, one plug-in hybrid, and uh, 43 hybrid on order. Um, I'd like to remind the committee that our fleet includes um, heavy vehicles, fire trucks, ambulances, light vehicles, and specialized equipment. So for example, 82 ambulances, 105 fire trucks, 452 heavy vehicles, which at present are not candidates for uh, greening uh, due to the nature of the vehicles, the technology is not available. And as we discussed around snow removal, the need to run these vehicles on the 24 seven cycles. Um, however, more information will be forthcoming in the report that you've referenced. Uh, thank you very much. Hopefully with the introduction of the electric uh, Ford F-150, we can get some of our uh, work guys uh, in electrics. Um, Councillor Hubley. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. A couple of questions to staff, but first, if I could ask the Treasurer, before Council, before we deal with the budget, would it be possible to get a, a definition of what the tax stabilization fund is so that folks know it's not like a cookie jar that we have to empty out, that it, it comes to help like Councillor Elshantiri and, and Councillor Blay uh, last year had a real emergencies that that money had to go for. So uh, if you could, I think it would be, benefit us all because I, I know my colleague has good intentions with what he wants to do with that money, but uh, I think there's others that maybe think it's a cookie jar. Um, I can certainly, I'll send around a memo uh, advising you of the reserves that we collapsed to create that tax stabilization reserve and also remind you that you set a minimum target balance in there of $34 million yeah. and we're projecting to have 18. So we're not quite there yet. And that's very worrisome, so we'll uh, definitely be talking about the reserves at uh, budget meeting. So for staff, a couple of questions to do with the uh, transportation budget. I noticed in there that uh, you're looking for 12.6 new staff, 7.3 will be for, um, I'm not going to ask you how you get the point, I, I think I know how that works, uh, but uh, to maintain the growing road, sidewalk and pathway network. But you're also looking for three staff to support the bike parking strategy and to improve the installation and maintenance of bike parking. I'm wondering why you would have three dedicated staff to that and why it wouldn't be part of a bigger picture because when you talk about bike parking you're talking about bike racks installing bike racks around and everything which is a great initiative. I'm happy to see it uh, come along. I just don't understand where the specialized staff come into that. I'll turn it over to Scott to answer that. Thank you. Chair, so this um, this was part of the municipal parking management strategy refresh, which was tabled and approved in October. Um, to this point, um, staff have been managing uh, bike parking, the installation and the maintenance of bike parking, more or less on the side. We have our duties within parking services, which relate to uh, maintaining our facilities. And then as we've had capacity to do so, we've installed and maintained the bike, uh, bike parking that exists. and. As the quantity of bike parking has, has um, increased, it's been harder and harder to keep up with that. So the intention of the three FTEs that were identified in October and are, are part of the budget, uh, the intention is to start to define a, a designated program which will allow us to better uh, to stay on top of the requirements and put, us, put ourselves in a good position. We're de developing a bike parking strategy, so to start to execute the requirements now and then implement the strategy when it uh, comes up next year. So these people are to develop strategy, not to install bike racks? Uh, Chair, no, the, um, these, the staff that are identified will be uh, involved with the coordination and the actual implementation and maintenance of, of the bike parking. So there's um, uh, two frontline staff involved there and, and another uh, resource that uh, has to do more with the coordination of, uh, of the efforts. 
and that's what they're going to do all year long. They, they, they couldn't fit into this other group above here that looks after uh, road cycling and um, everything else. Where is it here? Uh, road, sidewalk and pathway networks. They wouldn't fit in that group. Mr. Chair, the, the staff identified, the three FTs identified would be located within parking services and, and the benefit there is that uh, the, they are, uh, the costs of those staff come out of the uh, parking fee revenues oh, okay. um, and uh, there will be cross uh, abilities to, for them to serve other purposes but uh, the focus we want to make sure that we fulfill the requirements we have around the bike parking. Okay. Thank you. Now, my other question is to do with the 16.8 million to replace water main sewers in uh, Montreal Road uh, from North River Road to Saint Laurent. One of the things you're listing uh, the money for is buried power lines, and I'm just wondering why we're doing that when in Canada North they had to do that as a local area improvement charge. So, Chair, as part of the 2019 budget, we had flagged that as part of the design for Montreal Road because there were accessibility conflicts uh, in terms of basically providing the minimum uh, passage of travel that we needed to, uh, for technical requirements, there was a need to bury a hydro. So, as part of the 2019, when we presented the first phase of funding for Montreal Road, we also identified the need for hydro burial. So it's to do for, uh, and I take it the other example, Canada North, there wasn't that need, it was just purely aesthetics? Correct. The, in Canada, there was certainly a lot of width. It wasn't an issue about space, it was more around the aesthetic component, and that's why it moved forward more as a local improvement. In the case of Montreal Road, similar to uh, Elgin Street, it was a case-by-case -case analysis working with hydro. Uh, trying to look at basically the current standards for hydro and also our standards uh, and basically we were not able to accommodate all of the components because one of the elements on uh, Montreal Road is not just a pure reconstruction, we're also adding uh, segregated cycling lanes. So in terms of trying to accommodate the cycling lanes and also a, a better pedestrian environment, especially from an accessibility perspective, we just did not, not have enough room to be able to accommodate all of those components. Okay, understood. Uh, last area I want to touch on is the intersections. We have, I thought last year it was something like 50 intersections that we have that have met the warrants for traffic singles, but we have not installed them. Uh, how are we doing with that list uh, with this year's budget? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So this year there's uh, 29 locations that are below the cutoff line. Um, and the gap in terms of funding is somewhere between 40 and 50 million dollars. So we have, uh, there is funding to install two locations, or three locations, um, one on Prince of Wales and Barnsdale, which is the one that's got the highest number of collisions. I think there was 23 over a three year period, um, as well as Hutmar and Richards Side Road, which has been on the list I think since 2010 um, in terms of uh, meeting the warrants. So those two are getting done as well as a uh, pedestrian signal at Laurier and, and Percy. Uh, so for the ones below what we are as part of the road safety action plan, uh, two of the pedestrian signals on this list are being uh, funded through that for installation. We're also uh, identifying, uh, there's two locations that we're gonna do the detail design this year so that it's basically shovel ready in case sure. we get additional Good. funds. So uh, that's how we're, uh, that's how we're and if you're money. able to do any of these projects cheaper than anticipated, does that money go into the pot to try to take yep. the next one down kind of thing up? Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hubley. Councillor Ford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll start with points that were raised before as it relates to snow. And the first component I'm interested in is, so I recognize we're a we're matching, we're increasing to the three-year uh, average, I get that, and that's good. But I don't understand how we factor in growth. So every year our city is growing in population, there's growth in roads, and I don't understand how, I, I guess to me there are two points, one which is if we were to stop growing, then you take the three-year average, and then you just take on the growth component and you add that into the overall base, but it's unclear to me. So the actual three-year average sits around 76.4 million. Uh, we've taken inflationary increases plus growth in order to get the $78.3 million for 2020. So we have taken that into account moving into this budget year. So it's a dual factor. Yes. Okay. 
Uh, on snow again, probably the last one on snow, on page five of the uh, transportation budget, snow disposal facility. How many do we have now? I know there's one uh, near Saint Laurent. Uh, and why, like, what's the purpose of that 15% increase? Because if you look at the fee components, we're pretty stable everywhere, and then there's the 15. Is that what we would charge private contractors? Because certainly we're not charging ourselves, I imagine. Yes, we have eight uh, snow disposal facilities in the city, and yes, that is an increase to the private contractors using those snow, snow disposal facilities. Nice and clear, okay. And then the other one uh, relates to um, Councillor Dudaz's points, because I think she's on to something very interesting, which is on the fleet side. I, I'll, I'll preface by saying we should, in our minds, remove all of the emergency vehicles and the specialized equipment, because that's a very targeted group, and as technology becomes available, fine, except for Zambonis. And I'm not dropping the Zamboni piece. It's, a, it's the easiest to electrify. You have a closed loop environment staying on site that really works 15 minutes out of an hour to, uh, on a 24 hour cycle. So if you can't make electric work in a Zamboni environment, you can never. So I'll, I'll, I'll get to the point that I was trying to make, which is we have this climate change um, council group. We're coming with a plan. We f this year we have the budget coming in. We're funding some fleet requirements, which I get. But then we have some procurement components that are tied into those funding, which is where I'm worried. The Zamboni last year, we got caught that we were in a three-year procurement. We were procuring, I can't remember the, the amount, but we were on the last year of procurement, we were procuring nine Zambonis. So I want to make sure, and this is the p component today that I'm interested in, is are we ensuring that our procurement going forward doesn't tie council? Because we're going to make important decisions going forward with the climate change action plan. And this all relates to, okay, we have, to, we have some fleet objectives that need to be done this year, but let's not make a mistake, like especially on OC Transpo, uh, we're buying buses, but let, let's not caught ourselves in procurement as technology improves, because we're going to be caught with um, less, than, less than at level uh, equipment. So I'm going to have to turn that over to Valerie. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so yes, we are committed to greening the fleet. Um, of the vehicles that we do have, um, there are 926 that are light vehicles. And for the Zambonis, we have acquired um, four electrical, electric uh, ice surface resurfacers. Um, many of these vehicles have lifespans of 10 years plus. So as we start to renew the fleet, we have the opportunity to replace them with newer technologies where they're available. Um, for 2020, for example, we are projected to purchase uh, no Zambonis. Uh, however, two ambulances, uh, some larger trucks, a triaxle combo, a boom truck, a flatbed truck, some specialty trucks, a boom arm mower. Um, off the top of my head, I think other than perhaps the sport utility and pickup trucks, we don't have a lot of opportunity, but I can certainly check into that for you. Um, and I want to, again, give the committee uh, comfort in knowing that we are completely committed to greening the fleet. We are committed to greening the fleet. No, I, I get that. I mean, uh, Marion and I, for years, I think every year I bring it up, and Don Donnell comes up, and we talk about how, you know, if there's a vehicle that's found that we could greenify, then we have a sub-envelope of money, then we see how it's done. I think it's time to, like, cr like explode the thing. We have heavy vehicles, which should be separate, but all of our light fleet should have a specific target on greening, and it shouldn't come out of another envelope. Because the, you know, there's a lot of reports now that the 2022 is kind of a ratio where it's an equalization ratio of where we're going to be in terms of electrification and hybrids and and so on. I think too often, and it, rightly so, we have such a wide array of fleet from buses to ambulance, as you properly described. But I think. At some point, we got to narrow it in because we have, for example, inspectors. We have so many inspectors at the city, yet they're driving F-150s. They never use the bin at the back, and they're a single driver. But on the other hand, I don't want to undercut the public works team that picks up garbage and broken, broken benches and stuff like that. So you're putting council and this committee in a weird spot when you bucket it. So I, all I'm saying for this year, my purpose out of this intervention is, can you assure us that the procurement 
for light vehicles or targeted vehicles like Zambonis does not carry us too forward, like maybe it's one or two years, but not a three or five year window, because I see things change. Um, you're absolutely right, Councillor, and contracts in the past have been a problem because we've gone out and we've procured a number of vehicles over a period of time, and you can't actually um, ignore that contract just because technology's changed. The vendors bid a certain price, understanding that that was the number of vehicles we were going to procure. So we did have contractual uh, agreements that we had to honour. With the work that Fleet has done to look at the right sizing and the types of vehicles that we have and what's coming out there, their objective would be to go to uh, shorter tender periods so that, in fact, if things were changing, we could finish in one year and move to something else the next year. That's, that is the objective of what they're trying to do. That's music to my ears. Um, okay, um, other couple of points. Um, so this one is a reality that I'm sure we all face. We have a given road in our community. It's not a new road. Uh, we have, I'll describe it as more than a pothole. It's a situation where Lila's team on public works, Br Bryden in my area will say, it's just too big, I don't have the equipment. So then we flip it to ISD and ISD says, well, we don't have the money for it. So then for me specifically on, on this budget, it's below the line, which is fine. But from a theoretical point of view, not investing on that pothole quick enough ex expands the overall cost and, and environment. So I want to understand how from public works to ISD, from a, from a uh, public investment point of view, how do you figure it out? Because I'm seeing major gaps from a pothole fix to, to a, a road repair that uh, is, is currently unfunded. So, Chair, a couple of elements to that, uh, to that question is, one is we do work very closely with Lila's group uh, and Public Works in terms of uh, the roads that are in need, some of the pressure points that they're seeing to make sure that the priorities that we're putting forward, um, that they're also concurring with those needs. The point that you're highlighting is a point that's been recognized in the asset management plans and also in long range financial plan that there is a gap between what we need to be spending and what we are spending. So there are roads out there that we should be attending to. Unfortunately, the funding is not there to, to get to them. And that's why when we talk about applying a risk based approach, it's really trying to look at what is the impact on the service so that we make sure that basically we are allocating the funding to those roads or those assets that pose a higher risk to service, which means that there will be some streets where ideally we should be doing interventions. Unfortunately, there's no, there's no funding available. That being said, usually those are streets that are going to be less, uh, less of a risk. And what we still do is work with uh, Lila's group to try to see, okay, is there a way that we're able to stretch the dollars as temporary measures until we can get there with more uh, with more substantial funding to be able to address the uh, the concerns on an ongoing basis. Well, I'm not going to follow. I, I'm not going to fall on this one. I, I I'm going to use the video that the delegation used to show you what I'm talking about because this is not my word specific. It applies across the city. Mm -hmm. We're not responding quickly enough to pothole fixing, which in my mind costs us a lot of money, and then it's too big for one team. So, I think. There's like something that's got to give. You got. You have to give Lila and her team the equipment that's needed to do the bigger patches because they don't have. I, I never heard a comp complaint about funding until it gets to ISD. So Lila's team's not about funding. It's about equipment and the range of that equipment. Mm -hmm. And then on your end, I get it's you got to identify pressures and how do you compare a road redo to that and you have to prioritize. But I'm saying as we wait for that because it's not happening. We continue to, it's going to cost us way more money and it's a bigger project altogether than if we had captured it as it happened, right? So I'll, I'll hand it over maybe to Lila. One of the pieces that we are looking at with, with uh, her group are, in some cases, they may be better equipped to address some of those repairs, uh, where instead of us managing it to a contract, it may be more effective for them for us to provide the funding for them to undertake it. So those are things that we are I see Shelley nodding that we are looking at trying to really stretch that dollar as much as we uh, as much as we can. 
So just uh, through the service delivery review and, and, and some of the things that uh, I'm trying to do or transform on the road side is looking at uh, our services in more of a proactive approach. So we will be moving into, we're going to do some pilots this winter uh, where supervisors will be out on the roads taking a look at some of the ones with the worst of conditions and when uh, the weather conditions and ground conditions permit, we're going to be using warm mix and doing more of a proactive view at uh, pothole filling and road maintenance on, uh, on a blitz type format. So we're not waiting for service requests to come in and, and try and pick one here, one there, one there. So we're going to look at more of a blitz format where we put five or six uh, hot boxes out with, more, with warm mix following where we can actually do full roadways at a time. So that's one of the pieces that we're going to try to move forward this winter and then into the spring where we're proactively looking at how we manage those potholes as well as working with Shelley and that's why she's, uh, she's nodding. We just met yesterday to talk about what is that middle ground and how can we help and how can they help. So we're trying to put some plans together where uh, we can manage some of the smaller projects on their end but the larger projects on our end and vice versa using the talents and the expertise that we each have uh, and shared funding. So we are looking more proactively. Two quick other points, uh, one which I believe is in your group, which is on page 99 and page 100. I just want a confirmation that both the parking life cycle renewal and the life, ci life cycle renewal of parking, one's 4 million and one's 2.5 million, that those are coming from reserve. It's unclear to me where the, rev the source is coming from, yet Scott's telling us, I see Scott nodding, so that's good, okay. Okay, and then my final question relates to parks and ride. So yesterday we had a, Tremendous presentation on phase two. A lot of members are excited around phase two of the LRT. I am concerned that, so I think we, sh we all share a common goal that we want to see an increase in ridership. And we want to see an increase in ridership as the LRT phase two opens. And one of the growth in ridership is that rider that's outside of the perimeter of the city who drives in and we want them to stop and park at a park and ride and jump on transit because then they start paying, right? They start paying either for their golden card at the park and ride and they start paying for a bus pass, which is our desire. So I just want, you, I, you might not have the answer today, but we have money in Scott's account as it relates to parking and I want to make sure that the road mapping of what we need to do in terms of parks and ride to have the capacity when LRT phase two is open is entirely in place so that we don't miss that, that window and that opportunity. Chair, um, the parking for transit would come from the transit fund. So that's how we, we fund those programs. And as part of our TMP, we are um, uh, looking at the um, park and ride uh, lots and as reviewing the strategy where they need to be located. So that's, that work is um, underway. So, but you're talking specifically about stage two and whether there's going to be expansion of the nearby lots. That was examined as part of the stage two program and the budget is, you know, the budget is what it is. And um, I don't think there's any expansion for the trim, uh, trim park and ride lot as part of stage two. Uh, there is a, a lot that's being built uh, by Moody, I believe. Um, but that, there's, uh, that, that's about it. Could we ask for this committee, or I, I don't know if it, this is in Transit Commission or our committee, but can the analysis be done as to the growth of LRT uh, as it relates to those who would drive and pick up a, a, an LRT station in the extreme areas and have a report on that? Because forget the funding for a second, from a theoretical point of view, we have to get there. So can we just have a mapping of what is, from your, your planning perspective, what's in place? Uh, yes, and we've, we've done that, and we've also done it for stage sure. three. And Can it you comes, share that with, uh, with me? Uh, yeah, it was part of the, well, for one, the Canada LRT EA. So every, every time we do an EA, we look at the ridership and how they're coming through, and whether there's a, a park and ride needed or not. The same thing is happening with the uh, um, Barhaven LRT EA. That, that includes uh, a look at uh, a park and ride lot there as well. So I can show you the link. I, I know that in Canada, there, uh, Canada Air LRT, there are a number of park and ride lots being um, proposed as part of that project. So just to clarify what my ask would be to, f to have that analysis, just pull that analysis specifically to parks and ride for west, south and east because I think just that, so that we have it because it's great intel you're giving me. I've never dug into that specific. I think 
We need to. Yeah. It, it, it's part of the EA, so I can send you the, um, the information from the Canada one. The Barhaven one we're still working on. So that would be the south, and for the east, uh, we'd have to look at what happened for the, um, for the stage two for that extension. Okay. I'll, I'll get you the information. Yeah, thanks. Just to clarify, I think the councillor wants to know for stage two, so this would be Trim Road, whatever the station is uh, in Riverside South, and uh, Moody, um, what the forecasted demand for a park and ride is versus capacity that exists today. I know that Trim definitely needs uh, an enhancement. So as part of that, I would ask what kind of lead time you would need to build a parking structure at Trim Road or these other two, uh, uh, Canada and or West End and South, uh, in order to have it open for the opening of, of the various Stage 2 extensions. So if Orleans is going to open in 2024, when would you need to know that you're building a parkade at Trim Road, as an example, or whatever you would have in the West End versus in the South End, et cetera? Uh, yes, Chair, I'll look into that. And this is not for December the 11th, right? Only if you need the money by December 11th to have it <laughs> well, open by 2024. Two, yeah. Stage, well, the budget has the drafted and yeah. stage two is a number of years away, so. Um, well, if a parkade is gonna take four years to design and improve and build, then I guess we need to get started on it. We have the land, but, so how fast can you build a parkade, I guess is my point, hmm. right? We'd have, thank you. Um, so I don't have any other speakers on the list. Okay, seeing none, uh, we've got um, a roadmap motion here. Is anyone, uh, do we have to vote on it one by one? Yeah. Is anyone intending to vote against any part of the budget? No. Perfect. Uh, can we approve the entire roadmap motion in one fell swoop? Okay. Yep. Uh, okay, so is it carried? Carried. Carried. Wonderful, thank you very much. Uh, we carried item four already, we received item five. Are there any notices of motion for consideration at subsequent meetings? Uh, seeing none, any inquiries? Seeing none, there's no other business adjournments. Our next meeting is the 5th of February. Have a Merry Christmas to everyone. And yeah. <laughs> Hey! <laughs>